Okay. So good morning and, and welcome to our first grand rounds of the 2020-2021 academic year. Uh, we are still on Zoom, so thank you everybody for, for joining and, and being patient during this uh, remote process. Um, it is, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. George Brown today, who will be giving us a grand rounds on the topic of the death penalty in psychiatry. Um, Dr. Brown is, um, he completed his undergraduate education at the University of Rochester in New York. Um, and he was a double major in biology and geology. Medical school was completed at the University of Rochester School of Medicine. And his internship was done at the United States Air Force Medical Center um, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. He went to residency uh, at Wright State University and the integrated psychiatry program with the Air Force. Um, Dr. Brown has uh, been a professor and associate chairman for Veterans Affairs in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at uh, Quillen College of Medicine at ETSU State, uh, East Tennessee State University from 1995 to the present. Um, he has been a research teaching and resident supervision uh, pointy at the James H. Quillen VA Medical Center and a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of North Texas Health Sciences Center. Um, he has worked at the James H. Quillen VA Medical Center as a um, staff psychiatrist, as the transgender healthcare facility lead, um, and has served as the chief of psychiatry from 1995 to 2012 at the James H. Quillen VA Medical Center. Um, he has had several academic appointments in the past and is widely published on the subject of um, transgender studies in psychiatry. And um, I'll introduce Dr. Brown for his presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Jensen. I appreciate the opportunity to lead off our academic year Grand Rounds program and just um, unfortunate that we can't be doing it in person um, since this, uh, this presentation that I've prepared really would have, I think, been better as an interactive presentation, but um, we all make do with what we can and try to stay COVID free. And in that regard, I'm, I'm not wearing a mask as some kind of political statement because viruses don't know politics. It's just that I am completely alone except for a large number of um, dead animals. No living things are anywhere near me, certainly not within six feet. So that's why I'm not wearing a mask to do our presentation. So one of the things that um, I know the Grand Rounds Committee has always been interested in uh, historically in our program is to try to get more topics on forensic psychiatry since that's an area where it's been a challenge for um, getting enough material um, in East Tennessee. So when I've been giving Grand Rounds over the last several years, I try to um, give programs that, that hit that um, particular area of, of forensic psychiatry. And, and if I can also add something about transgender health, another area that's um, undertaught in almost all medical schools and residencies in the country, if I can kill two birds with one stone, I'm gonna try to do that. So that's part of the um, intent with today's program. And I'm not progressing, let's see. Brian and I went through this last week and it worked. For some reason, I'm not able to progress the slide. The down arrow? Yeah, try down arrow, space bar, enter. Okay. Wonders of Zoom. So uh, I've run into this problem before. I hope you don't mind me jumping in. But sometimes Please, anybody who can help, I'd appreciate it. If you end the screen share and then redo it, sometimes that fixes the problem. Okay. Thank you. Stop share.
Okay, well, at least we got to the next slide. Um, conflict of interest declaration, um, none, um, no conflicts on this whatsoever. No small animals were harmed in the development of this presentation. <clears throat> and in terms of timeliness, um, I actually started working on this program before the federal government decided to end its 17 year moratorium on um, executing federally um, convicted um, uh, criminals. So um, they've done that now and I'll have a couple of brand new slides on that, but this is quite timely because it's been in the news uh, over the last four weeks or so. So just as a spoiler alert, um, you're definitely not gonna leave this lecture with any sense of closure. This is a disturbing topic, I think, for most people. Um, no matter what culture you're in, um, this is a difficult topic. And the more I uh, do forensic cases involving condemned people, the more I learn about it and the more I learn about myself in the process. So if I think there's a way to do a poll here, is there not somewhere? Yeah, all right. So. How many people here on our 35 participants on Zoom believe in the death penalty? Can I do that as a poll? Uh, that's not the poll I want. Well, if we were in person, I'd just ask for a show of hands um, and can't do that here. Um, and in general, some people raise their hands, some people don't, but the point of the slide is the death penalty is not a religion. And asking this question in this way, which is the way it is usually asked, you don't even think about, in some ways, the inappropriateness of the question. Because we don't ask, do you believe in major depression or do you believe in um, other things that are realities? So it's not, it's not a faith-based situation, it's a reality for some people in our country and in some states in our country. But this is the way the question is often asked. Just something to think about. And now it's locked again. Not going well. Okay, oh, we have a poll. Oh, it's not quite um, asked the way I asked it. Do you believe in the death penalty was is actually the actual question. So you can pull there. We've got about 60% voted so far. Sixty-eight percent voted. All right, so we got about three quarters of people voting with about a 70-30 split, which uh, I'll show you how that compares to national polling on that, on that topic. Okay, share results. Okay, and I'm locked again. So maybe we only get one slide out of every stop share. Resume. Okay, so as I was saying, the standard way, the standard way the question is often asked and assumes it has elements of faith rather than fact. Um, so obviously a highly controversial topic. We've got roughly 70% of the people on our uh, 35 participants today are saying that they saying um, no to that question and 30% saying yes. Um, in my experience working with forensic cases, which has have really re revolved predominantly around transgender healthcare topics, but not exclusively. In fact, I just did a malpractice deposition last night, which may be another grand rounds down the road. But um, these cases of which I've had three now um, have been by far the most challenging professional and I think in some ways personal ethical dilemmas 
And I think I'm not alone in that regard for people who are so-called real forensic psychiatrists like Dr. Vermette and others who might be on this line today. Um, both APA and Apple prohibit direct participation in state-sponsored executions. Uh, the AMA's position on it is that physicians should not determine competence to be executed, but they can provide information to, to be used in such a determination. And that's a pretty difficult distinction to be made, I think, um, and in, in some ways puts psychiatrists in some ethical bind, um, depending on, again, how you feel about the situation and how you believe our professional organizations prohibit in any type of involvement. So physicians shouldn't treat prisoners to restore their competence to be executed. Um, and you're supposed to treat only if a commutation order is issued prior to starting treatment. So commutation means that the patient, uh, that the individual, which would be a patient in our case, would have their sentence changed to usually life in prison without the possibility of parole, meaning they would not be executed. And then, then you could treat them as you would any other inmate. Now, the double bind with that is, what if a person does not have their sentence commuted, they are still on death row, and they're actively suffering from a severe untreated psychosis. So do you let them psychically suffer? Um, and would you let them suffer in the same way from uh, a cut arm or a broken limb? You know, the psychic suffering is obviously very real and very difficult. And should we just let those individuals not be treated? I leave that as an open question. So from 2000 to present, the APA's position has largely uh, been a moratorium on capital punishment in the United States um, until jurisdictions seeking to reform the death penalty can implement policies and procedures to assure that capital punishment, if used at all, is administered fairly and impartially in accord with the basic requirements of due process. And that, um, for many people who might respond to a more complex set of questions about do you agree with or, or believe in the death penalty? Some people in, an, in open conversations would say, well, that depends. It depends if you can assure me that everyone who is executed is in fact guilty of the crime that they were convicted and sentenced to death for, and that it's evenly applied uh, across racial and ethnic lines and that it's not being um, uh, misapplied in, in any situations, then I might say, yes, I agree to it. And that's actually a common response in an interactive environment around that question. So again, just to pound the point that we work within a, within a set of, of guidelines that our profession, our professions um, provide for us and psychiatrists should not participate in a legally authorized execution and may not assume roles that lead them to facilitate, implement, develop, or monitor any techniques involved in execution. And that's as much legalese as it is um, common English, because what does participate mean? Does that mean can you treat someone who has active psychosis to relieve their suffering or not? And there are actually a number of articles about that very topic. So there may be some personal ethics and morals that conflict with professional ethical guidelines in, in otherwise reasonable, reasonable people who are reasonably trained. Um, and that if you do become involved in these cases, you should be aware of some of the prohibitions of, of different types of involvement. Um, there is a website, um, Death Penalty Information Center, that is um, a staunchly anti-death penalty information source. I put that up there just because it's one of the sources of information among others. There are also pro-death penalty information sources out there as well. So getting back to where our group fits in, public opinion has changed significantly over the years. And now in this country, the most recent poll um, of a much larger group than 35 of us is about 54% support the use of death penalty in select cases. So a little different. You can see over the years how that's changed. Um, and we're at not quite a historical low. Um, historical lows were in, in the mid 60s. Um, think about what was going on in 1965, 1966, for those of you who can remember that far back. It was a very different time and place in the United States. Then things changed over the years and now we're trending back towards that, that low point um, 
of around 47%. <clears throat> so for a number of years, the, <clears throat> the death penalty was on, was on hold on a constitutional basis. So since 1976, when the death penalty was essentially reinstated constitutionally, there have been in excess of 1,465, probably 1,470 since I made this slide just a few weeks ago. 31 of the states have the death penalty on the books. In terms of um, distribution racially, um, about a third are black, 8% are Hispanic, and 56% are white. So the Hispanics, um, Latinx are un underrepresented on death row, while African Americans are overrepresented on death row. And, and Caucasian whites are underrepresented as well in terms of proportion of the population. The victims, meaning the, the people who were the victims of those who are condemned to death, are three quarters white, 15% black, and 7% Hispanic. There have been 161 exonerations since 73, and three of those were here in Tennessee. And I'll weave through Tennessee information as much as I can throughout the program. Um, Generally speaking, although not always, those exonerations were based on DNA evidence that was either not available, lost, or found um, after the fact, after, after conviction, but pre-execution, obviously. So we know that in at, least, in at least 161 cases where people were sentenced to death prior to the sentence being carried out, it was proven beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt that they were in fact not guilty of the crime for which they were being executed. There are approximately 2,620, although that has now dropped after some federal inmates have been executed, so 2,615 or so. In Tennessee, there are 62. California has by far the most, what's well, the largest state at 746. Interesting less, interesting, less than 2% of all death row inmates are women. And by that, I mean, um, birth sex women and trans women are not counted specifically, although we, we know that there are trans women on death row, also since that's what I'm, what I'm going to talk about later in the program. The peak year for executions was 1999. Um, apparently people wanted to get them in before the uh, Y2K and the, and the end of the world as we knew it. In 2019, last year there were 22. So here's our home state of Tennessee stats updated as of approximately one week ago. Since 76, there have been six executions. Prior to that, 335, our current death row population at Riverbend um, outside of Nashville is 53, with one of those being a woman, um, cisgender woman, as best as I know. Um, let's see, the murder rate per 100,000 across the state and we can thank um, Memphis and Chattanooga for increasing our numbers in that regard, um, puts us at 7.3. Is life without parole an option in Tennessee? It isn't in all states, but it is here. And in some states, not all, a defendant can get the death penalty for, convict, for being convicted of a felony, even if the person was not responsible for the murder. So the classic example is two people go in with masks on to rob a, a liquor store. One person has a gun, um, the robbery goes sour. The person with the gun decides to kill the clerk behind the counter. The other guy may, may not even have known he had a gun. The other guy had a gun when he went in. Nonetheless, both of them are caught and both are convicted and sentenced to death. That's the classic example. Um, we've had three exonerations um, who were not guilty um, of the charge for which they were going to be executed, and there have been three additional clemencies. So one of the purviews of the governors of states, um, as well as the president of the United States, is to grant clemency, um, and usually that's in the last minutes or hours um, before someone is about to be executed. The governor is contacted and may or may not choose to um, to grant clemency, meaning discontinue the death penalty for that particular individual. In Tennessee, most recently, 13 since 2000. And, and in this state, um, if you were convicted prior to, I believe, 1999, um, you actually are given choice. Choice is good. You get to select between the electric chair or lethal injection. So people who are more recently um, 
condemned to death do not have that choice. It's lethal injection is the only option for those folks. Um, and I've been um, fascinated by the fact that a lot of people who have the choice are choosing the electric chair as the method of death as opposed to lethal injection. And I'm wondering why uh, that is, and I'll pose that to the group. Why, why do you think someone on death row might choose electrocution over, over a lethal injection? Shame, remorse. So you're thinking maybe it, it, it's a harsher way to die and maybe they, they have some masochistic components or feel particularly guilty and want to die the harder way. Maybe spite. That's a thought. Um, of course, we don't know the exact reason why um, the majority of people since 2018 have chosen the electric chair in Tennessee, but we know what the people say. And what they say is there have been so many botched lethal injections that have not been lethal. And the lure amongst death row inmates is that lethal injection is remarkably painful and much worse than going by uh, route of electric chair. So that's lore within the death row community. Um, and that's what inmates say when they're choosing an electric chair over lethal injection. So as I mentioned in the intro, the federal death penalty had been suspended um, for the last 17 years, having been a single execution. And um, Attorney General Barr has ramped that up. Um, in the past, um, um, 17 years uh, or more ago, uh, some of the more famous people who were executed included Timothy McVeigh, who was a domestic terrorist who destroyed the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City. And if you've never seen that um, that monument to that destruction of that building and the death of all of those people, many of whom were federal employees and the children of employees, it's really uh, quite um, stunning and moving. The federal death row is in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, there are 62 currently there, one cisgender woman, 44% white, 42% black, 11% Latinx, again, African-Americans being overrepresented on federal death row as well. Now there are four executions set for this summer of 2020. Um, and uh, I can't make slides fast enough to keep up with the pace right now. But um, of those, there's actually now I believe seven or eight set and, and no longer is two correct as of uh, July 20th. I believe it's now four. Um, and the lethal injection methods vary from state to state. Um, and the federal government is using a single method, which um, kind of makes some sense as well, um, using a large dose of pentobarbital. All of these um, executions are for capital murder with special circumstances. For example, Dylan Ruth, the person who um, uh, is self-proclaimed white supremacist and killed all of the individuals in a Charleston church massacre um, six or so years ago. He would be an example um, of the types of individuals who are executed federally. Well, you can't have a grand rounds without talking about COVID. So um, now we have execution by COVID. Um, as, as a, um, a third method of execu execution besides lethal injection and um, the electric chair. So if you get COVID in prisons, which it's looking like some prisons, the vast majority of individuals are becoming infected, some prisons as high as 80% infection rate. Um, there have been a number of people on death row in spite of the fact that they're in isolation cells and not roomed with anyone else. Um, in San Quentin in California, um, four people up to the time that I wrote this slide, four awaiting execution um, died via method of COVID-19. 29% um, on death row at the time I wrote this were positive in California. So there may well be additional COVID-19 um, executions as opposed to lethal injections. In terms of costs, capital punishment costs in the United States, and this does not apply to other places in the world where capital punishes, punishment is much swifter and cheaper, often in the form of a, of a noose or a bullet, 
Um, it's much higher cost than non-death penalty cases on the order of at least 300% more compared to individuals who don't um, get the death penalty with the same crime. California estimates it's spent $4 billion just since 78 on death penalty cases alone. Um, Kansas estimates that their defense costs are about 400 k for death penalty cases and one quarter of that for uh, cases that are otherwise similar but without um, the attorney general um, asking for the death penalty. In Texas, it's estimated as 2.3 million per case, which is about three times the cost of the highest security single cell in Texas for 40 years. So in other words, if you didn't ask for the death penalty and went for life in prison without parole, and that lasted on average 40 years, you would save two thirds of the costs involved in seeking the death penalty. Um, I don't want to belabor this point, but again, I, I've talked about lethal injection. Um, some use triple drug cocktails, some use single drug. Um, there are no capital punishment in the blue states. Um, Nebraska is actually the only state that has a death penalty without lethal injection as a, as a method. It exclusively uses electrocution. However, that was found to be in violation, so they actually have no method of execution in Nebraska. So what, one of the arguments is you, if you're going to execute somebody, it needs to be done in a humane fashion. So you can't violate cruel and unusual punishment of the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution in delivering execution methods. And there's a tremendous amount of case law regarding that. So with the advent of botched executions with triple drug methods, um, there have been a number of those. Most recently, um, a pretty gory one in 2018, Doyle Ham in Alabama. There's lots of information on, on Mr. Ham's case. He was scheduled to be executed um, for uh, uh, slaying a motel clerk 21 years earlier, and that's a common scenario that the average time on death row is somewhere between 20 and 30 years prior to um, execution if, if the person is ever executed. This is an inmate who had IV drug use history and had been treated with a number of chemotherapeutic agents that destroyed his veins um, for cancer while on death row. And um, arguments were made by both him and his attorney that trying to find venous access for the execution would be difficult. Um, those court challenges to the method were, were not successful. And after over two and a half hours and 12 attempts to gain IV access, and this is actually Mr. Ham's, uh, some of the locations that they attempted to obtain uh, access, the state ended the execution attempt just prior to the midnight, midnight deadline. So if execution hadn't been completed by midnight, um, the, that um, writ of execution um, expires. So the defense attorney was uh, quoted as saying it was gory, botched execution, they gave up when they could not find a vein. Supreme Court, on the other hand, has upheld the single single drug method of pentobarbital, which wouldn't have mattered in Mr. Ham's case since they couldn't obtain the uh, IV access. The, the public is fascinated on some level, horrified, fascinated, choose your words, um, with death row inmates. Um, and there are a lot of psychiatric aspects to this. M many people on death row, including all of the ones that I've been involved with, have pen pals, admirers, people that contribute to their commissary fund. So for inmates, for those of you who don't interact with inmates on a regular basis, if, if you want to buy anything from the commissary, the little store like snacks or extra food that's not part of your, your daily rations, you have to have a commissary fund out of which you can purchase things. So people on the outside, family, friends, people unknown to you, um, can log on to your state's um, Department of Corrections website and you can select donate X dollars to inmate number so-and-so, you know, John Doe. And about 30% administrative charges are taken by, um, by the Department of Corrections and about 70% goes into the inmate's commissary fund. So interestingly, people on death row tend to have fairly um, well-stocked commissary funds, um, and often case, oftentimes more so than people who are not on death row. 
some of the individuals who are involved with death row inmates believe that they can change serial killers, for example, um, seeking to nurture the little boy that the killer once was. In other cases, there may be secondary gain um, for the, the individual, usually um, a, a woman involved with a male uh, convict, and some actually seek book deals, and that was the case that I'm gonna talk about later. And then psychiatrically, there is a paraphilia, not surprisingly, there's a paraphilia for just about everything called habistrophilia. And this is a paraphilia involving sexual arousal to a partner, or in this case, a potential partner who has committed some outrage, including rape or murder. And some have called this the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome, since um, when Bonnie got involved with Clyde Barrow, she um, obviously knew that he was uh, not just an outlaw, but he was a, a serial killer um, in the crime sprees that he had been involved with, and she chose to be involved with him nonetheless. Um, it's not uncommon for serial killers, particularly to get hun hundreds of love letters and gifts. Ted Bundy, Jeff Dahmer come to mind. Um, and the case that I'm going to talk about on label, I'll call JR, uh, was involved heavily from death row with two women, one in a non-sexual um, uh, pen pal type relationship that involved a book deal and one of which um, was and, and is sexualized and um, JR claims to be, uh, um, this woman is his fiance, her, is her fiance at this point. And I'll talk more about the case here shortly. So as I mentioned, I've been to three death rows and those have been Florida, South Carolina and Ohio. Interestingly, no one's asked me to go to Tennessee um, I've had one case in each location. All of them involve some aspect of transgender identity or gender dysphoria, hence the reasons for attorneys contacting me specifically. All of my involvement has been post conviction. So not, not involved with sentencing, not involved with, did this person do it? Was this person uh, mentally ill at the time they committed the crime? None of those things, those things all happened in, in, in all three of these cases decades before. Um, so what's the point of my involvement very, very, very late in the game is uh, in some cases mitigation or reconsideration of, of an inmate's waiver of appeals. And I'll talk in some detail about that because these are areas where psychiatrists um, who are in, some of you may, may potentially be involved in such a situation in the future. So, and nothing I'm showing is um, proprietary, um, all available on the internet. So you can, see this is a picture that's available on the internet. Um, this is a 40 year old individual has been on death row for 20 years now. And between the age of 16 and the present time has only had lived six months outside of a prison setting, which has got a lot of implications for what type of knowledge a person may have since there's not ready access to internet, cell phones, smartphones, um, although they are smuggled in, there, there's not regular base, regular access to those to learn about what's going on in the world or about healthcare or transgender healthcare for that matter. Had an extremely abusive upbringing, physical and sexual abuse, forced sex with multiple family members, five suicide attempts um, as a pre-adolescent by the age of 13, um, which is a pretty serious history. Two auto castration attempts before the age of 18, which were documented in the records. Went to schools for emotionally disturbed children, had lots of alcohol and drug use as a teenager with past diagnoses of borderline personality disorder, PTSD, and dissociative disorder. Now, interestingly, juries in Florida on death penalty votes prior to 2016, this was a not only a surprise, but a shock to me that you only needed nine of 12 jurors in this case to vote for the death penalty. Um, it did not have to be unanimous. And if I did a poll, which I'm not going to do, I would hazard a guess that of the 35 of us on this, that probably at least 30 or 34 of us would have believed that you need a unanimous vote uh, in favor of the death penalty. Well, that was not the case up to 2016, the Supreme Court eventually struck down that um, provision in Florida and in, in several other states that actually was still extant in up to 2016. Now it must be unanimous. 
and the judge cannot override a unanimous, unanimous decision in favor or against the death penalty. So un unfortunately for JR, the Supreme Court ruling for some reason unclear to me only applies to those who were sentenced to death prior to 2002. Why not 2003 or 2001 or at any point, I don't know. JR was uh, sentenced in 2000. So that nine out of 12 vote still stands for JR. But since his co-defendant in the, in the crime that I'm going to describe was not sentenced until 2002 due to a number of delays and it was a separate trial, it did apply to his co-defendant. So his co-defendant had his sentence changed from the death penalty to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So for those of you who are, who are very interested in this particular case, there is actually a Amazon Prime um, reenactment, 45 minute reenactment of this, the crimes that these two individuals were involved with um, on a program called Wicked Attractions. It's season five, episode 12 from 2012. I knew that this um, reenactment existed prior to going down to see um, the inmate in Florida. I chose purposefully not to see this prior to going down to see the inmate. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, but to summarize what happens, what happened in this uh, crime, which actually is fairly accurately portrayed in the episode, according to the inmate um, from what he has heard. Um, J, I'm just using initials, JR and XY um, lured a gay cousin of one of the two with very limit, had limited intelligence, um, IQ probably in the 60s, um, lured him out with them and killed him with a knife in a premeditated fashion in, in the woods, buried him in the pine woods in a shallow grave and went back home. It wasn't found for many weeks afterwards. Then there was a second murder where JR met a local teenage girl from the same town, invited her on a date, actually met the mother, um, mother said, well, you make sure she's back by 11 o'clock and shook her hand and looked her in the eye and said, yes, ma'am. Um, as I said, um, they, the plan all along was to get this teenage girl drunk, to have sex with her and then kill her. And they brought all the necessary supplies to carry this out in their truck in a rural area. JR shot her in the back of the head and then XY engaged in necrophilia on the very recently killed teenage girl in XY, um, who turns out to have had paranoid schizophrenia, uh, surgically removed this young woman's calf muscles, put them in a plastic bag, and then in a freezer for future consumption. They buried the remainder of the body, again, fairly shallow um, grave that was later dug up by um, animals. They denied any knowledge of where the victim went after the date. They just said she got upset, left, uh, ran, went, ran out um, from the truck, and we don't know where she went. Then there was a third crime a couple of days later that just involved a random rifle shooting of a father who was watching television in his living room with his wife and children. So it was a suburban neighborhood, drove down the street, picture window was open, saw the person sitting there watching TV. They stopped their truck on the, uh, on the street and put the, the gun on the edge of the truck and shot the victim in the, in the neck through the picture window. And surprisingly, the victim actually survived the, that attempted murder. So JR and co-conspirator XY were convicted of what's known legally as heinous crimes. And that's legal parlance for really, really bad. Not just bad, but really, really bad, like odious, wicked, evil, atrocious, monstrous, you fill in the, the blanks here. Not just um, going to a liquor store, having a, a robbery go bad, and the, the clerk reaches for a gun, but you have a gun, you beat him to the draw and, and shoot him and he dies. That wouldn't be considered a heinous crime. It's, it's potentially a capital crime, but it would not be considered a heinous crime. So in, in both of these individuals' cases, just to 
take the DNA out of it and any question regarding guilt out of it. There is zero question about guilt in both of these individuals' cases. There are, there are no DNA tests or any other evidence that will ever exonerate them. Um, so these two individuals um, fall in the category of uh, people who were not wrongfully um, convicted of heinous crimes. So just having described all of that, and I could have done it in a much gory fashion than I did, I, I encourage you to explore what personal feelings you can identify in yourself after hearing this story without even having seen the Wicked Attraction episode. And if we were there interactively, I would ask people what feelings they would be having, but commonly, um, professionals' responses mirror those of the, of the jury who might be hearing such a case. Feelings like disgust, revulsion, um, maybe even fear for the safety of yourself, or your family. Could this happen in my town? Am I going to start closing the drapes when I'm sitting in the living room watching television? actually had somebody bring that up. Um, I had some people just in disbelief, really. Did somebody actually do necrophilia and then take the calf muscles for future consumption, um, anger. So a whole host of generally negative affects um, that I think most people would be able to identify in themselves, which are relevant to a jury, but also relevant to somebody like a psychiatrist who is going to go and see that individual on a regular basis. So not me in this situation, the, a prison employee or a, a contracted out, in most cases, a psychiatrist or contractors for inmates, um, in terms of dealing with transference, counter-transference issues, you really have to check yourself in situations such as this, um, as do I, just being involved in an evaluation situation, not even being involved in the clinical care of such an individual. So the legal process for these cases is, is very tortuous, lengthy, um, and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through every step of it, but suffice to say that this is pretty much the process um, in most states. There may be some nuances here and there, and federal has some differences, military has some differences, but suffice it to say that, that um, there are a number of appeals that are built into the death penalty process, and appeals are guaranteed um, as the default mode so if you're convicted of a capital offense, um, you're allowed at least a couple of different levels of appeals. And of course, you're allowed attorneys. And you also have the right to waive appeals. And that's where psychiatry comes into play. So if you just take advantage of all your appeals and your attorney just files all the appeals that you're allowed by law, that generally would take a minimum of 10 and usually 20 years if all the appeals are utilized. Now, some or more of these may be waived by the inmates, but I can tell you that in my experience and in reading, reading these cases and others, the judges really bend over backwards to allow for appeals of death sentences and do not accept waivers of appeals lightly. And it's, however, having said that, once an inmate is, is found capable of uh, providing consent for an appeal waiver, it's extremely difficult to reverse that later on. So it really should be looked at as if you waive your appeal and you're found competent to do that, good luck trying to get that reversed. You need to present new evidence. So for example, DNA evidence or something else that, um, that wasn't present before for reconsideration just to consider a rescinding of that appeal waiver. So in this, in this particular case, 10 years ago, long before I was involved in the case, JR went to court to apply for a waiver of post-conviction and post-sentencing appeals, basically saying that this would clear the way completely um, for lethal injection in Florida. So it would remove all obstacles um, to execution. So the state had two state hired um, competency evaluations, there were no independent evaluations done um, on behalf of, of the inmate. Um, and I raised the question, is that a conflict of interest? Um, because there certainly is um, quite a bit of data looking at 
state hired um, evaluators and outcomes of uh, those evaluations. And not surprisingly, um, the vast majority of the time they come down on the side of the, of the state's interest as opposed to the inmate's interest. I, I just raised that as an observation and I can't make conclusions regarding that um, observation or association. Um, the judge tried to get JR to change his mind and I actually read all these transcripts and the judge is, is one step short of begging the inmate to um, not waive the appeal, but nonetheless, JR was allowed to and did waive. Um, in terms of the co-conspirator, conspirator, JR met this co-conspirator XY while in a locked state psychiatric hospital when they were teens. Um, XY also sentenced to death, has paranoid schizophrenia, um, not in contact with JR at all, although they are in the same prison in um, rural Northern Florida. And XY did not waive his appeals. And as I mentioned, as a result has been commuted. Um, I've already covered that, so I'm gonna go past that. So my involvement, I was contacted by the Federal Public Defender's Office. This is a little known office that is paid for by federal funds um, to, for the most part, defend death row inmates. And that's, that's pretty much all they do. And there are multiple offices around the country that do this work. Um, and they learned about me from prior involvement with Department of Corrections cases that were not capital cases. And they requested an evaluation for whether or not JR has gender dysphoria since there was a lot of evidence to that, re to that effect in 25 years worth of records, but there was no discussion of whether gender dysphoria untreated might have interfered with the voluntary and knowing aspects of his appeals waivers 10 years ago. So that was a, the potential avenue legally and psychiatrically to open the way for a potential um, a reversal of the final waiver. So that was the goal of the evaluation was to give a psychiatric opinion as to whether that might or might not be happening. Why is that important? So you're probably familiar with suicide by cop. Um, and for example, there's a study of 707 police shootings through 06 showing at least a third of those were likely suicide by cop situations, meaning that the person almost always by virtue of mental illness chose, was, was going to commit suicide, but chose to have a police officer discharge their weapon, usually multiple times, um, to kill them as opposed to them taking their own life, um, which can imagine also has psychiatric implications for the officers um, who are involved in such incidences. And I've seen a number of these of people who have survived um, attempted suicide by cop in, in um, incarceration settings. So the, the analog here is in, in death row, you have state assisted suicide. So use a common example, if, if an inmate is convicted to death, has major depressive disorder and is suicidal anyway, um, maybe irrespective of the fact that they're um, sentenced to death, they could just go before the judge and waive all their appeals and say, well, I'm gonna kill myself anyway, but I, I would just rather have the state do it for one of, of multiple reasons I may have to do that. Um, it's estimated that um, not all, but certainly a significant minority of executions um, involve inmates who have waived their appeals rights and, and have engaged in state assisted suicide. So that's one of the things as an evaluator, you're looking for whether that's possibly happening. Um, reason being that if you're not if you're not competent to waive your appeal, then your appeal is not waived, and you can't um, be executed on that basis. Um, so logistics of the evaluation are really quite um, circuitous as well and tortuous to get involved with this. So once I, I got to the point where I could um, go down there to Florida, I got all the way down there got through you know five inner levels of Dante's Inferno um, only to get a note from the inmate saying they refused to see me. No reason given, just refused to see me. Um, so I hung around for another couple hours to see if he might change his mind in that regard. And I was told that the, well, that was the one chance there wouldn't be any other opportunity to do that. So when I got back home, I did in fact watch the Wicked Attraction episode 
um, assuming that my involvement in the case was concluded. However, six months later, the public defender called back and said that, that, that he was authorized a second visit, which was a surprise to him and certainly a surprise to me. This time the interview did happen. Um, I can share some of this. Um, the gender dysphoria was previously present and reported, but was never addressed and was uniformly ignored by every person who evaluated um, JR throughout 20 years un until one psychiatrist um, noted in the record said, well, I don't really know much about gender dysphoria, but it might be a possibility here. You really need to get somebody who knows something about this to do the evaluation. Um, interesting aside is for essentially 10 years, there was no bar whatsoever to the governor of Florida signing the writ of execution. There was nothing. The, the, all the appeals waivers were, were, were gone and, and Florida does kill people. Um, second or third highest, Tennessee is vying for second over Florida. Um, and I asked the public defender that and I said, well, in 10 years, why hasn't, why am I even able to do this, this evaluation? This person should by all rights be dead at this point. He says just basic administrative incompetence was the only answer he could come up with in that regard. Um, so I provided an evaluation suggesting that gender dysphoria not only was untreated, was not recognized, and um, could have contributed to um, a possibility that the waiver was not fully knowing because this individual in an information blackout since the, since the age of 16 did not know that there was any possible treatment for gender dysphoria, um, certainly not in a prison setting, but a heck of a lot has happened since he was 16, like a lot of cases, many of which I've been involved with, that have won rights to treatment for gender dysphoria for inmates in both federal custody and state departments of corrections. And this inmate had zero information in that regard and just assumed that um, the, the suffering that he, and I'll use he because that was the pronoun he used with me, um, was something that he had no choice about and there was no no relief other than death for it. So this is from uh, 2018 at some point along the way um, with failure of um, the federal, pu federal public defender using my evaluation at that time to render a decision in favor of the inmate. So as it stands right now, there are still no um, appeals um, that prevent this inmate from being executed as we sit here today. So in my interview, I asked the inmate, and in, well, I was there for uh, well over three hours in a single session interview, and at the end, um, I asked him some questions about his views on the death penalty, and this was some of what came from that interview. And this was a quote from him. He said, for some people, death is the only option, the only answer for a few of the people in here, meaning of the other 50 some odd death row inmates, all, all of whom he knew. Um, in fact, he had knew, knew a person who had been executed like a week before I had I'd gone down there for this the second trip. Um, and I use she because later on, um, JR started using female pronouns. So she says some have alcohol fetal syndrome and the mind of a nine-year-old with no malingering. That's her quote, and should not be subject to the death penalty, which I thought was an interesting insight. And he said, if you're gonna execute someone, just do it and don't drag it out 20 to 30 years. We die in here every day. I can't even name 10 fruits due to sensory deprivation. That was one of the things in the evaluation. So she also said, I don't believe it's a deterrent at all. No one in here thought about it, meaning killing someone. He said there wasn't a single person there who said, oh, well, I better not pull a trigger. I better not commit this crime because I might get the death penalty. Not a single person thought of that in advance. And then one of the final questions was, well, how do you feel about the death penalty for yourself? You've said that you think it applies to some of the individuals in here that you consider, you know, excessively, well, 
evil to the core or some other terminology um, that she used that were, were not redeemable and should have the death penalty. I said, well, how does that apply to you? And she said, I won't begrudge them, meaning the victim's families, their revenge, but I don't think it will bring them closure. So as, as another interesting thing as part of the evaluation, here is an inmate um, who is in um, state custody. Um, so should this person now diagnosed properly with gender dysphoria, which is untreated, should this person get access to treatment for gender dysphoria? Should this person go to a female prison instead of a male prison? Should this person have access to female canteen and, and personal grooming and hygiene items? Should this person have general sex reassignment surgery paid for by the state, like inmate um, Adrian Edmo just did in the state of Idaho uh, approximately five weeks ago, another case that I was involved with. So I raise all these questions. Of course, that's another whole grand rounds. But the long and the short of it is that different healthcare rules should not apply to death row inmates compared to other inmates. Um, according to the Eighth Amendment and case law and, and prior cases regarding access to medically necessary care for legitimate medical and psychiatric diagnoses. So is this a new frontier? Yes, it's a new frontier in the 20 years that I've been doing it. And I keep trying to put myself out of business and making this an old frontier. But until the Supreme Court weighs in on the questions that are listed on this slide in some important way, it, it remains a state-by-state -state frontier. There are standards of care with respect to incarcerated individuals. Um, this is available on the WPATH.org website, which I encourage anybody who's taking care of anyone with gender dysphoria to download for free. We are in the late stages of developing version eight, which will have um, uh, an update to the section that I that I've written on institutionalized incarcerated care, and it will apply will apply broadly to people in institutions, and will be slightly up upgraded, updated. But the basic essence is the same: that whether you're in a prison or not, you're entitled to medically necessary health care, the same as other inmates um, with or without gender dysphoria, whether or not you're cisgender or transgender. So we're right at uh, 12 according to my watch and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you Zoomies may have. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you very much for, for that very informative presentation. Um, I did have a message from Dr. Hanson Cook um, regarding the, the cost to the taxpayers, but um, you, you had addressed that. Right. Um, and then she did want me to pass on a, a thank you from, from the VA uh, for for this topic in this lecture. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Brown? You can either um, type into the uh, chat or you can raise your hand on the Zoom and then. Dr. Bias. Hi, Dr. Brown, thank you for the lecture. I was just wondering, was it as hard for the patient to trust you and establish rapport when you, you know, broach the subject having knowing that he suffered for this internally for so long? Yes, definitely it was. And, and, I, and that was part of the, the reason um, why she chose not to see me the first time I went down there was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as her, I, I'm embarrassed. I, I, I don't know whether I can trust this person. I don't know, know whether I really wanna talk about this with anyone, I'm ambivalent about it. Um, I don't know that there's any treatment for this anyway, so what's the point? Um, so yeah, all of those things were involved, but, but between then and six months later, um, partially due to the involvement of the second woman involved as a pen pal, who is a, a quite intelligent woman from Europe, um, she said, what are you talking about? There's no treatment. I mean, there's all kinds of treatment. And, you know, this guy Brown has been going around doing these cases for 20 years and you can get access to hormones in prison. So what are you doing? That changed everything just the, the knowledge that, that there was access to care changed the entire equation for this inmate. Now, I don't know if it'll change the outcome for the inmate, but it changed the approach and, um, and the, pay, the inmate now clearly doesn't wanna die. 
Thank you. Other questions? Thanks for the comment, Greg. And I, I would hope that at the end of this, like I said in the beginning, that you haven't reached closure on much of anything and that it has encouraged you to um, think about this topic from a mental health standpoint, from a personal standpoint, and from a citizen standpoint. And, and, I, and I'm also not presenting a particular position on this. Um, that it should or shouldn't happen. I'm not. I'm not coming down in any position regarding that. I'm trying to present this um, reasonably, objectively, and pointing out some of the objective difficulties with um, capital punishment in the United States without without answering my own poll with respect to what my personal um, position on it is. But um, and and also, I would hope that you would think think about this. Um, as a mental health clinician in, involved with people who are frequently unstable, frequently involved in, in criminal activity, and who may become a death row inmate. People that you're seeing right now may become a death row inmate. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much once again, Dr. Brown. I appreciate everybody's attending today. Thank you. Thanks, George. Good to see you.